I don't think it would be too much of a stretch to say that, that these days, Japan does make the best denim in the world. And, and with this amazing denim, they, they make some of the, the best jeans in the world. There are the, the big names, there's the, the Ironhearts, the Momentaros, the, the Visus. Along with those, there's the, the equally amazing, but maybe slightly less well-known brands, such as, as Oni Denim, Strike Gold, or, or perhaps Full Count. But then there's the brands that are maybe big in Japan, but that Japan is keeping all to itself. They are doing some incredible stuff. We've just never heard of them. And so today, that's gonna change. So here are three incredible Japanese denim brands that you've never heard of. Okay, before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video, do you guys wanna play a little guessing game? A brand on this list is a sub-brand of a very well-known, very, very famous Japanese denim brand. Here's one of the pieces and here's the name of the brand. And the mother brand is one of the Saka 5. Any guesses? Okay, we're gonna to get to this a little bit later on. And no, no Googling. And also, before we go any further, I really need to apologize to, to all of the brands that I'm gonna mention here. I'm gonna to have to apologize to anybody who speaks Japanese and anybody with ears. I am going to absolutely butcher these pronunciations, guaranteed. And with that being said, Let's get into it with one piece of rock. Yes, I, I did start with this one because it's the easiest one to say, but also because it is the most denim heads denim brand on this list. The other brands, yeah, they do make incredible jeans, jackets, and whatever other denim garments, but they also make a, a bunch of other stuff as well that's, that's non-denim. One piece of rock, on the other hand, is, is really a hardcore denim heads denim brand. They go deep into the, the obscure models from a very, very specific time in the history of the blue jeans. And that is, is World War II. I mean, World War II really was a, a fascinating time for, for, for denim, for the, for the jeans industry. The, the wartime rationing meant there was a shortage of all the raw materials that went into make a pair of blue jeans. And so the, the, the industry, the denim industry, had to adapt to, to these changes and these shortages. The most famous example of this would be the, the 1944 Levi's 501 model. The rivets were left off on, let's see, the coin pocket, and I believe the crotch rivet was removed. The arcuates, uh, because that was extra, extra stitching, extra material, they were left off and Levi's chose to paint them on. The pocket bags were, were always a surprise. They were just made out of whatever material Levi's could get his hands on at the time. And took the construction. I mean, a lot of the people that would have been sewing these, these jeans together were maybe overseas fighting or, or doing other things. It takes a little bit of time to train up new sores to make a pair of jeans. I mean, this is an easy thing. And that's... That really shows in the construction of these jeans that were a bit um, haphazard, to say the least. But what would have been seen as a, as a construction flaw way back then, now provides us with some really interesting, actually fascinating reference points. And that's exactly what one piece of rock just leans into with their models. Their entire collection is based on that very short period of time when rationing restrictions really affected the production and the, the details of, of blue jeans. So that's from maybe 1942 to 1947. And within that, one piece of rock looks at the models that were provided for, for the civilians, that were provided for the personnel that were involved in military, military construction, and also the models that were available to the US Army personnel through the, I think it's called the the army exchange post. The civvy models and the post exchange models, they've got the, the sloppiest, sloppiest? Most sloppy? Both sound nasty. They've got the, the least precise construction. Although I guess to replicate that sloppiness in, in these jeans must take a lot of precision. But anyway, okay, so yeah. Civilian models and post exchange models, not that great intentionally. But the ones that were made for, for the, the military workers, they were really on point. They were up to scratch. After that, One Piece of Rock offers the M46 models. There's two of them. So that's from 1946. 
And this reflects uh, a return to sort of the normal availability of the production materials. The offering ends with the M47. That is, of course, based on the iconic Levi's 501 from 1947. Ending on this model, it really makes sense. It nicely bookmarks the, the collection and the offering from one piece of rock. And the, the whole brand just acts as a, as a really interesting, a fascinating history lesson in this, this very small period, but very important period in jeans production. I mean, after this time, like the, the history of the blue jean kind of gets rewritten. It, it goes from being this workwear staple into being more of a, a fashion item. And this, the, this change is, is kind of marked here. It's also worth noting that there's a couple of jackets, uh, also reflecting the shortages found during the war. And the other one, the, the next one, is reflecting the, the time that things are getting back to normal after the war. And that's one piece of rock. Like I said, it's a denim heads denim brand. They, they go like hardcore into the geekiest little details. The next brand on the list is a little bit more contemporary, I'd say. But if you look at the pieces, if you look at the pieces, you can really see this is put together with somebody with a huge amount of knowledge and a huge amount of passion about denim and about denim history. But before that, how did you get on with the guessing game? Have you, have you seen this piece before, kicking around anywhere? Have you heard of that brand? Did you Google it? Did you? Have you got any idea about the mother brand? Well, here's another piece and here's another clue. The mother brand is the oldest of the Saka 5. But next up, like I said, something a little bit different. Cottle. And this is one of the brands that I mentioned that they, they, do, they don't just do denim. They do a, a variety of different, different fabrics, different pieces. But you can clearly see they've got a, a love for, for vintage workwear and they've got a love for all things indigo. This means that they've just got an amazing lineup when it comes to their denim offering. They've got everything rigid and unwashed through to really washed out and patched up and everything in between. One thing in particular I really love and respect about Cottle is their ability to take very well-established classics and add their own, own twist to it. A perfect example of this is their take on, on the sawtooth shirt. And it, it's got all of the things that make it a sawtooth shirt, but they, they add like that oversized fit and then a boxy silhouette with that spread collar. It's just it's adding that cottle DNA to make a classic their own. There's also their take on the, the original denim jacket, the 1890s blousen from Levi's. So they've got the pleats running down the front, they've got the, the patched pockets with the rounded edges, but they've added this very interesting looking collar. It's just, it's again, it is taking that classic as an inspiration and then splicing it with the cottle DNA. Jeans and pants wise, they've got some solid classic silhouettes. Anything from a, a five pocket straight fit jean, to, to cargo pants, to, to sort of more workwear inspired pants, all ranging from full on raw to completely washed down and patched up. I mean, all of these, they can't be easy to do. They really can't. They must be very time consuming and very expensive, but the results are absolutely incredible. Cottle really is just a, a master glass in taking the best of, of Western workwear and then the best of, of Japanese heritage manufacturing and silhouettes and blending them together. I'm actually wondering at this point if if you've actually heard of either of these brands and I'm just really late to the party. Uh, let me know in the comments below and while you're there, like and subscribe, that would be amazing. Right, okay, moving on. Uh, did you get the brand? So, one of the Saka 5, indeed the oldest of the Saka 5. Yep. Studio D'Artisan. Amaro Sankaku Pique is what happens when Studio D'Artisan gets a little bit freaky. They take inspiration from US workwear, from French workwear, from classic military garments, and mix that up with, with pretty oversized boxy fits and silhouettes, along with some pretty heavy washing, shashiko stitching, uh, some borrow fabrics thrown in there for good measure, and they, they create some pretty unique garments with that, with that mix. The pieces must be a labor of love. I mean, take this Type 2 for example. The washing and distressing by, by themselves is, is an accomplishment. But then take a look at the patchwork that you're going to find in the shoulders and then down in the inside of the arms. This is made by, by taking antique indigo dyed Japanese fabric 
and then cutting little triangles out incredibly, incredibly precisely. Then they mix them all up, sew them back together, and then this patchwork is sewn into the shoulder and the inside of the arms of the jacket. And after all this is done, they do some really, really heavy washing. And the results, they are absolutely incredible. It is again taking this, this Japanese, traditional Japanese techniques and then applying them to uh, an Americana block. And th this idea is rolled out to a few pairs of their jeans and indeed the, the heavy distressing is a big part of their entire collection. I, I'm not the biggest fan of washing and distressing to make it look like, like something's been genuinely worn in and genuinely faded. But I have to say, with the borrow work combined with this, the level of skill and expertise to, to create this level of washing, I, I could be tempted. I mean, just look at this pair of French workwear pants and, and the chore coat that seems to come along with that. They genuinely look like they were pulled out of a barn somewhere in the Algarve. I mean, say what you want to, say what you will about, about washing and distressing a garment. The, the level of know-how and the level of skill involved to, to create this, to achieve this result, is, is pretty impressive. The military-inspired garments, they're not quite as heavily washed out and distressed, but they do still have that, that lived-in, real-world feel to them. Now, I got a shout-out Bergen Shield in this one. And the other ones I came across, stumbled across when I was browsing around the interwebs, but Marus and Kaku Pike, I only discovered that because Kai and his amazing team at Bergen Shield, they had it hanging on the shelves. Hanging on the shelves? Lying on the shelves? They had it in the store. Okay, those are three pretty obscure Japanese denim brands. At least I'd never come across them before. I'd be interested to know if you had. Um, let me know down in the comments if there's any that I'm missing that you think are worth checking out. I'm really curious, as always. And with that, if you want to get a little bit more into the weeds with, with five of the ten denim brands that every man should really, really know, then I'd suggest checking out this video here.